Friday. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Really? You know what? Nah. <laughs> it got you to laugh, though. It got you to laugh, though. That was the point. Calm down, y'all. Yeah. Oh, we live now. We live. We lit. We lit. <laughs> we lit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. All the spaceships and rockets. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think I can do it. So you can do it. You can do it. I think I can make you a hose. <laughs> More mm, for so make host. Yes. Yeah, we'll now you should be dead yep. to go. You should be able to hit record and everything. You are the host. It's all on you. Okay. Do you want me to hit record? Yes, because we live. We live. Okay, so you got to do it because you're the host. Hi, everyone. It's been a long time. Let me just post because life want to be funny like that, but that's all right. Bye. How's everybody doing, my esteemed colleagues? Yes. <laughs> Very good, despite all of the strange electronic difficulties throughout the day. Mm. Yes, we, we apologize for the tardiness. It really wasn't intentional. Um, but we're here now. And thank yes, you right. all. I, I can't see who's tuned in. So I will just say thank you all for tuning in this evening. As thank we you. Begin the conversation of mental health. Yes, let me just contact and let everybody know because they've been asking where we're streaming from. I've been telling them, bear with us. We're having technical difficulties. So let me just let them know. That we're we coming out of retrograde. We are live. <laughs> well, while he's doing that, just so we can get things moving, um, we'll just uh, do a brief introduction of who we are. I am Natasha. Um, by professional trade, I am a nurse. Um, I have a history in working in adult and geriatric behavioral health. Um, I'm an advocate for it. Uh, I am one who has had mental health challenges of myself. So we will be sharing those things as well. Um, but uh, this was very imperative. Um, first of all, shout out to the visionary and the founder of Back to Love Movement, Don Wisdom yes. Crook. Um, thank you for your vision and this opportunity to begin this conversation within our community. Um, so I won't say too much right now, but, uh, I'll give it over to T. All right. Greetings, everyone, everybody. My name is T. It's spelled T-I. So everybody, most people call me T-I, but it's really T. Either way is fine, but you know, anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm a content creator and also mental health advocate. I also have my own mental health diagnoses. Um, and uh, I mean, it's all about growing together. That's, that's what the passion is. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to this whole segment, this episode, everything mental health. Everything went to happen. And so. And I, oh, sorry. 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 Okay. Yeah. My, okay. I didn't want to interrupt. My name is Soul. I'm a hip hop artist, poet, writer, extraordinaire. And 
I just want to get to the nitty gritty of our healing because we want to really make some impact in this society. We have to train our minds, heal our minds, and nurture what we do not face on a daily basis. Because if we ever want to really change what's going on from the police brutality that's going on from this past year, from handling this pandemic, we have to train and heal our minds and take the time to treat it as every other body part in our body. If something was going wrong with our kidneys, we had cancer, broken bone, we get that fixed. We have to take more attention to what is most neglected and that is the wounds that are not seen. So this is the Mental Health Podcast. And first episode, it's been a long time coming, but we're here. We're here, ladies and gentlemen, we're here. Shouts out to Gifted. She's in the building right now. Shouts out to everybody Thank else you. coming in. Um, and we're going to get started. So start off with the purpose of this podcast, of course, as we already aforementioned before. The purpose is to empower, not only introduce, but empower the Black community to remind them of their inherent greatness. Just because your mental health may be declining or you're having uh, have mental illnesses or disorders or issues that seem unbearable to take, there's still a way to handle them and live a productive and strong life, a happy life as well. It is possible. Too, many, too often we are maligned to believe that our circumstances are forever and that's just not true. We're at a point now where we know information. There's information that's available to us to take action now. So this the purpose is to give the, you the tools to take that action. So we're gonna start off this by explaining what is mental health. So I'm gonna have the very illustrious Natasha go into detail on that and then we'll just move on the conversation from there take the floor okay so first and foremost um i think another thing that we also want you to know is that anyone that may have a struggle with anything whether it's depression um a for sure clinical diagnosis um or just some things that have come up that make you wonder is something going on just know that you are not alone um, statistically, over half Americans in this country um, have mental health issues. Uh, specifically in our um, community, um, I don't think you can turn on the television or get on social media and be exposed with what's going on today and not be affected some way psychologically. And so um, just know that you're not alone. Um, this again is to begin the conversation um, that has been from generation to generation so taboo, especially in our community. Um, when it comes to African Americans, Black people, people of color in this country, um, we have not had a voice to discuss the challenges that we face within of the mental health community. So we as members of the Back to Love um, movement, we, will want, we want to start that conversation. So I think one of the things that kind of causes people to shy away from having the conversation is not understanding the language. Um, there's a lot of terminology that we hear and um, I know as a people, sometimes uh, we fear our own ignorance. And even with that term, it's basically to lack knowledge. You know, it doesn't make you um, incapable of understanding. It's just that you, not, you lack knowledge of the language and the terminology used within um, the field of mental health. So I have a few definitions to just uh, read off, just so that you can understand when we use these terms, what we're referring to. Um, 
So first of all, we'll be talking about eventually um, stigmas affecting us in the mental health community. Um, a stigma is basically a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. Um, when you are clinically diagnosed with um, a mental disorder, um, we have really made people feel uncomfortable um, speaking about their diagnoses because when we think about mental health and we think about mental illness, it's oftentimes equate to that person is crazy. And that's not true, you know? Just like a person um, has a physical disorder such as diabetes, hypertension, that's just a part of who we are. This is what we have acquired. And this is what we have to deal and learn how to cope with in order to be a more well-rounded individual. Um, Another term you'll hear is health disparity. Um, that refers to a higher burden of illness, injury, disability uh, experienced by one group uh, relative to another. So um, uh, when we talk about health, health disparities, you'll hear stuff like specifically for our community, the black community, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, things of those nature, uh, of that nature, what we would consider like health disparities. Um, one of the conversations uh, me and my partners here wanted to talk about was the difference between mental health and a mental disorder. So mental health is the level of psychological well-being or an absence of mental illness. It is the state of someone who is functioning at a satisfactory level of emotional and behavioral adjustment. That is mental health. It's a part of being in a state of homeostasis. When I say homeostasis, that's a state of balance. So one may ask, well, how do I know I am mentally healthy? Well, you can ask yourself several questions. How do you deal with stress? How do you deal with conflict? Um, how do you cope with, um, how do you cope with, um, I had a brain fart, trauma. All these things would uh, affect one's mental health. Um, as far as a mental disorder, uh, one will have to be clear. First of all, this is a diagnosis. It's nothing that you should um, try to self-diagnose. You have to see a professional, um, undergo some testing, um, and then based on your results, the diagnoses will be given. Uh, but a disorder is a functional abnormality or disturbance. Medical disorders can be categorized in mental disorders, physical disorders, genetic disorders, emotional and behavior disorders, and functional disorders. So these are some terminology that I just wanted to throw out there briefly um, that you will hear as we go along. And just on your own research, um, if you watch any type of documentary or any literature that you um, read, I would really um, encourage you all to, you know, get a better understanding of what is actually being said. And don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, to get clarity when it comes to um, mental disorders and mental health. Um, as far as mental disorders, um, a mental disorder are, uh, mental disorders are conditions that's going to affect your thinking, feeling, mood, and behavior. Um, and mental disorders are common. They're more common than we realize. Um, depression is a mental disorder. Anxiety is a mental disorder. At some point in time, we've all experienced that. Um, and statistically, according to the World Health Organization, one in four people will struggle with mental illness. One in four people. 
So it's closer to home than we realize, you know. Um, it's just, we don't acknowledge it. We, we kind of um, label, you know, instead of um, getting that individual or getting ourselves help or seeking help for things that we're um, facing. And um, how does um, this apply to the African-American community? Mental, mental health issues within the African American within the African American community are often linked to psychological stress and of systemic racism. Um, as a result, African American adults are 20% more likely to report serious psychological distress than white adults. Unfortunately, statistically, one in three African Americans who struggle with mental health issues will ever receive appropriate treatment. So one in three of us psychologically stressed in white adults. Unfortunately, statistically, one in three African Americans who struggle with mental health issues will ever receive appropriate treatment. So one in three of us psychologically stressed in white adults. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, I'm here. Struggle with mental health issues will ever receive appropriate treatment. So, one in three of us. Second, everyone. Huh? Okay. okay. Continue on, Natasha. I don't know I'm what sorry. That kind of threw me. Okay. Um, <sighs> so, one in three of us um, basically will experience a mental health issue that will go untreated. Um, in my own personal life, uh, my sister um, was clinically diagnosed later in life, like in her 50s, with bipolar disorder and personality disorder. And she did not know this, nor did we, her family. And I will say that unfortunately, she was labeled um, negatively. But had we known that she was struggling with mental health issues and she could have gotten the treatment that she needed early on, a lot of the things that she experienced in life, perhaps she wouldn't have. Um, I was sharing with my partners before um, in my um, um, employment and mental health, dealing with adult behavioral health, a lot of our patients who were bipolar uh, we saw that there was a tendency to um, self-medicate because one, there was no resources to, for them to get treatment. Um, they, couldn't under, they couldn't afford the medication due to lack of insurance. And again, they didn't know what was going on with them and knowing, not even really knowing that they had um, bipolar disorder, which we'll talk about later on exactly what that is. Um, and so they would self-medicate in order to cope. Self-medicating means um, taking drugs of you know, whatever their choice is just to be able to cope with their conditions. So again, one in three of us will go untreated. Um, do you guys have anything to share uh, before we go on? more yes and i think it just highlights um the greater need even more the need to speak on these matters and take it seriously because for a very long time we just did not have the resources to talk about these things at all we didn't wasn't sure how to articulate it and it's time now uh it's it's becoming less about introducing it now it's more about how do we go about bringing it to people and it's settings like this where we bring the knowledge to people to have a starting point because mental health is a journey. So the more we take the time to actually uh, seek out resources to get to a state of healing and figure out what the problem is, then we'll be much uh, further on than we have been and be able to tackle the issues that's going on in our individual lives as well as the community. 
And not only that, reestablishing a sense of trust between the African American community and mental health professionals, because historically, we have been used a lot um, in um, mental health research, just medical research. We've been used a lot. Uh, a lot of experimentation have, has been used with African Americans over time, which would um, cause us to kind of not trust people, practitioners, um, and then feeling comfortable culturally. Um, do you understand me as a black woman struggling with a mental health disorder? Because that's important that, mm -hmm. that the practitioners are culturally sensitive because as I stated before, a lot of our mental health stems from systemic racism. You know, um, having a sense of anxiety just driving down the street when the officer pulls, you know what I'm saying, behind you and you wondering, am I just going to get out of this with a ticket or am I going to be the next hashtag? You know what I'm saying? Just from a simple traffic violation, you know? So it's just, again, reestablishing the trust between the African-American community as with the uh, mental health practitioners. Um, do you have anything to add? Um, I'm just honestly um, glad to, to be a part of this, especially, you know, going through through my own uh, personal mental health, you know, issues. And the just like you were saying, like, it's important that we bring this out because um, we hide it a lot. And anything that is hidden can be easily broken down. And the more we shed light in these dark spaces, you know what I'm saying, the the better we can heal together, not not just individually, but feeling like you have some someone or some people to uh, relate to or relate with, it it feels so much better. Like the healing process is so much better and easier. You know what I'm saying? And making uh, allowing each other to feel like you belong, like what you're going through this mental health thing, it's more than just clinical, it's real. It's, it's more than just a statistic, like it's, it's a real human experience. And for us to just be like, you know, to more and more just be okay with not being okay or admitting that you don't feel okay and let's get through it from there. You know what I'm saying? It's not just some, some white folks thing. It's a human, it's a real human experience, whether you even whether you've even experienced it in that, you know, in that shadow of po police brutality is still that same nervousness because of media. And you know what I'm saying? Like our environment. So I'm just, I'm glad to be here and I'm, I'm on the ride, so. And to and add and to I what like you said, you... oh, sorry, go ahead, please first. I was just going to say, I like how she put that, a real human experience, because it's exactly what it is, whether you're suffering with mental health or you are, you know, you know someone who is suffering, we all have to understand what this is like. Um, we all have to either, you know, understand how to cope with it or be empathetic to it, meaning, you know, understand not, you know, actually having a disorder, but you know, the relativity as T was speaking about, that is imperative because I think that is what's going to open up the conversation. Because like she said, it's gonna show somebody like, wow, it's not just me, mm -hmm. you know? Wow, it's not just me feeling this way. Oh, I'm not, you know, outcast. I'm just having a human experience. Mm -hmm. So I really like that piece. Thank you. And what I was going to say is you had mentioned something key about so uh, just in the sense of, sense of surviving in this country is knowing history. And I think a lot of people think that mental, he mental health in Black communities is not as talked about, is not as taken serious, not as cherished, not as talked about, is because they'll know history. On one spectrum, 
you have people that you have have people that have been trained to think that our life is not as meaningful as theirs. Whether they know it or not, it's subconsciously embedded in them from a culture that they may not even agree with, but they will have certain behaviors that encourages that and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, as we mentioned earlier, not knowing what all was going on, our forefathers not knowing all that was happening and then not giving a way to rehabilitate yourself after that is just a buildup of trauma, 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 trauma that it's built up and it's formed into these uh, disorders or behaviors. Um, and knowing just what makes this environment tick, it helps uh, you differentiate what is uh, a difference between you having a mental illness and you just having low mental health. Because some people mm -hmm. could be thinking that they are one diagnosis and not knowing this can be something completely different. Or you right. may feel like you're having the behaviors of ADHD, really you're just very anxious. But because you don't know this information about what the different distinctions of it all, because it's like Natasha told me uh, before when studying for this, take your time because one hour, one hour half is not enough for me to, for us to teach who's on the screen right now. And sure enough, one book is not gonna teach me the plethora of centuries of study. So it's, um, it's a starting point. We're getting there. I think we're, more and more people are being aware of it and are wanting to talk about it. So oh. I will lead into uh, who said it, famous quote of the day. It's by Audre Lloyd. And it says, I come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. And the reason why this stuck out most to me is because it is a vulnerable topic. It, it's almost taboo. Um, I know at least when I was growing up, the um, mention, the, it wasn't even in the vocabulary, mental health. Like, what is that? Um, right. And when you start to delve into those topics, it's almost just like for different reasons or another, it's just not an area to talk, uh, to talk about. So that leads us into the question, why is it important to talk about and why are we not talking about it? I think the uh, we, one of the reasons why we don't talk about it, which we'll delve in further, is the stigmatization of mental health. Specifically in the Black community, when you had problems of that level, it was automatically lumped in the spiritual. Now, where we go for a healing in the spiritual, for most of us, it was church. You got an issue, you pray about it. You can do all you can, just pray about it. But no one really could articulate why my cousin seems so sporadic. Why do I have certain thoughts that just don't seem normal? Why is um, my son so jittery and he does not know how to calm down? So the answer usually got you into your pastor, your church leader at the church, and you would just pray about it. So that is prayer is important. I will not disown anyone for that. I pray myself. It may not be uh, the God that you pray to, but I do pray. I do believe in spirituality, but there's other work that needs to be done. You do all that you can, and then and you, you pray along with that, but you do something about it. And there are people out there that are trained to know these different types of behaviors, these different types of um, uh, feelings that one person has and start to guide them on a direction to where if you know what the problem is, you can fix it. So, but that is on top of that, the plethora of things that we as African-Americans have to go through. One, it's hard to get medical coverage and even when you get medical coverage, as you, uh, Natasha mentioned earlier, it's hard to find a culturally sensitive doctor. So 
it is higher times likely that you will get diagnosed with something that is not your diagnosis. Um, one of the information I found said you are 10 times more likely to get misdiagnosed uh, about five times before you get the right diagnosis as a black, as an African-American in this country. Right. That's a lot of time and a lot of frustration for someone who is trying to just get fix over something that they might just now getting the, the, the inclination to want to get help. So that's one thing. Then there's uh, obvious, um, obvious is of poverty, um, racism, of course, and we already mentioned police brutality or the lack of information or not be, just being able to speak on something of that level of vulnerability in environments where from anywhere at this point, everywhere you look, you're looked at as a threat. When you're automatically deemed your life as a threat, then you're automatically in survival mode. So your immediate surroundings that you have and control of, you must worry about. You ain't got time to worry about what's going on up here. So that's a little bit of a tidbit about why I think we're not talking about it. And it's, it's more, and we're gonna delve into that uh, a little bit more in the future. But um, I'll leave this to Tierra. What do you think? Um, as far as why we, why we don't talk about it, um, definitely because it hurts. Mm. <laughs> it hurts and a lot of us don't want to feel that pain. We don't want to face that. It's like voluntarily hurting yourself and it's internally. So it's not something you can soothe on the outside. It's something that's raw and heavy and hidden in so many of us. And nobody wants to voluntarily hurt. And it's and we've come into that positive vibes only thing. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like it, every, you know what I'm saying? We exclude like the healing process of the positivity. Like you have to go through the negative. You have to heal through the negative to get to more positive. Like there's levels to it, but we don't, we hide from that. We don't want to see we don't want to feel that real, that realness, and it, it consumes our bodies. That's another subject, though. But so that's 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 the main reason. That's how I feel because it hurts. That's interesting, and that's that's really uh really um imperative to know because if if you physiologically look at a wound and what happens um, through the healing um process so you cut yourself so certain things you may bleed um there may be inflammation um if that wound is open and um not cared for then you know infection may set in and even with the medication certain things happen you know pus and all that kind of stuff you might have to debris or um tear away dead um tissue in order to help it um, heal. So the same thing happens psychologically. Like for instance, in therapy, people uh, have the misconception that therapists have a magic wand. You come in laying on the couch and they got a magic <laughs> wand and they say, oh, poof, you're better. Like <laughs> you gotta get, especially let's talk about something that is relative in our community as far as trauma. We've all experienced it one way or the other, right? Trauma is not an easy thing to deal with. And it's not roses and sunshine. It's very, um, like you said, it's painful, you know? Mm -hmm. And unless you have the tools um, that you need to be able to cope and heal from that trauma, it could be very detrimental to your mental health. And just going back to something that Soul said, I mean, we are dealing with generations upon generations of trauma, just not passed down from our ancestors from slavery, 
but just interpersonal trauma within our own families and communities from our own experiences. And, you know, it's, that, it's always that thing in our community, don't, don't tell nobody, don't say nothing, don't air our business. It's what happens in this house stays in our house. That's some bull, like, no, nobody here heals from that. There's a wise woman once told me, you are only as sick as your secrets. Mm. You're only as sick as your secrets. If you don't talk about it, how can you heal from it? You know, find someone. And, and like Soul was saying, yes, you have to have some practicality when it comes to spirituality. You know, spirituality, like he said, is a tool to help you get through the trauma, to help you get through the disorder. But even if you have to take medication, medication is only going to do so much. I tell my patients all the time. For instance, if I have a patient who's a diabetic, that metformin is only going to do so much for you. You got to eat right. You got to right. exercise. Right. You know what I mean? Uh -oh. You got to take your medicine. You know what I'm saying? Not just <laughs> some your water. but drink. every day. <laughs> you know, just like with mental health. If you got to meditate, mm -hmm. if you got to journal, if if that medicine is taking, because I don't, I don't advocate, I don't say don't take medicine because medicine has a purpose. It helps stabilize condition. Understand that. That is the purpose of medication. It's not a cure. It's a means to help stabilize conditions. But like Soul said, you have to do work. And that is critical. It's not just going to go away. And the more we suppress the things that affect us, the worse off we are going to be. So this is your safe place. This is the opportunity to discuss those things, to get that out so that we can heal. Yes, and I'm gonna follow up on what you said, Natasha. Um, I do wanna add uh, some, some a little bit of empathy dust on what you said, combined on both what you and Tierra said. As a whole, as a as a as a community, as a culture, you say it yourself. We have mountains of trauma from multiple different angles, and this makes me more compassionate when I look at just humans in general, mm -hmm. um, especially our community. I don't fault somebody from tired of feeling hurt. When you get traumatized and traumatized, and it's that embeds in your DNA, that embeds in your family interactions in ways they don't even know fully how to describe. We're still unpacking. And when I hear, when I know people that know need to be on medication and they self-medicate or they're in quote unquote toxic relationships trying to feel a void, I know where that mindset is coming from. It's coming from, I'm just tired of feeling when you're experienced that on a not even a daily, just daily basis, just one person a daily basis, but then you see everyone else that you that looks just like you deal with that on a daily basis and they don't have answers just like you, that's gonna embed a, an identity of, an ideal mentality of this is just the way it is. I'm not about thriving. I'm about coping. Once again, survival mode. And then also looking the culture, looking at culture of the society we're in. Well, nowadays it's so easy to get something with a flick. Just get on your phone, look up anything you want, Google it, and there it is. And you ain't got have to worry about any of these thoughts that's happening. You ain't got to worry about anything because your boy, your phone got your got your back. So you can have an easy way, easy fix to not deal with that. And as Tierra said, it hurts to dig through all that crap. You got to dig through that shit to get something beautiful out of it. You got to go through all that pressure. And some people just don't want to deal with that level of pain. But once again, as you said, in order for us to move on, we have to start digging. 
and I'll give you one example from my own personal life. This actually happened today. There is someone in my family who I have just deep, aggressive emotion to. And I meditate on it after I uh, did some exercise. Take care of your physical health too. Exercise, stretch out, that helps the body too. You gotta sweat out that negative toxins. But I meditate and I start seeing her face. And mm. just going with it, instead of just trying to keep my mind quiet, I started visualizing her and it was almost like a journey of seeing this person for who they are as opposed to what I thought they were. And I was able to articulate why I didn't like, like them. And it was hurt because at the end of the day is I love you and I see you destroying yourself. Mm -hmm. So you destroy other people to compensate for what you feel inside. Mm -hmm. And just coming to that realization, that acceptance and crying it out and get it out of my system and articulating that, I have a lot more peace about the situation as opposed to before. It's just like, I just don't deal with her. I don't think about that. Allowing yourself to actually go through, why does this make me feel this way? Individually, on your own time, that's the inner work. That's the hard work. It's not nothing physical you do. Pills won't take away it. Even if you were to take, uh, if I were to take medication now for what I for what I deal with, the work that I do outside of that medication is going to define how productive my life is going to be on a daily day on a daily basis. So you have to do that work. All right, I'm going to look at some of these comments that people have been leaving. I appreciate everyone dropping the hearts and likes. We got when so, so these just some, um before we get to that just some bullet points um that we we touched on um one of the things that I think consistently um, has been said is the matter of empathy. Be mm -hmm. empathetic for your brother and your sister suffering with mental illness or not even just suffering, but um, coping and dealing with their um, mental illness. The suffrage will come from the lack of treatment. Um, uh, and just empathy for yourself, for real. Like, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, don't think negatively of yourself because you're um, uh, experiencing this human experience. Um, some bullet points uh, in re relation to mental disorders, it can be occasional or chronic, meaning like Sol said earlier, it could be a decline in mental health, which is uh, acute situation, which is a short term situation. That's what I mean when I say acute or it is an actual clinical diagnosis that is chronic over a long period of time. It'll take a long period of time of treatment for you to get to that optimum level of mental health again. Um, it can affect your ability to relate to others. Um, someone spoke about that. Um, untreated mental health or um, unaddressed mental health can really um, affect your relationships. Um, it, even with yourself or externally, and it can disrupt function or activities of daily living. Some people um, with certain diagnoses cannot do what we take for granted with of the ability to be able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Someone who is dealing with um, extreme depression, getting up out of the bed is a struggle. Yes. Yes. And that's a real thing. Like um, I, I mentioned earlier, my own um, mental health um, issues deal and surround with depression. There are there have been days that getting up out of the bed was a struggle. Like physically trying to get the strength up or the emotional uh, capacity to move from my bed to the edge of the bed to stand up, to go out and, you know, get started with my day. That's a real thing, like Tierra said. It's just not a diagnosis, it's a real thing. You know, it can be a debilitating thing. Um, you know, just because everybody wants you to be okay. You know, mm -hmm. um, one of uh, the actors, Robin Williams, um, 
he suffered from great depression and you know he has this profound quote but it basically was like you know some of the happiest people suffer in silence you know because they have to be happy for everybody else you know sometimes if i'm having you know a rough day and i'm pushing through it you know and somebody picks up on it it's like here i say don't let nobody make you feel like not being okay is not okay. Like today, you're just not okay. Deal right. with that moment. Do what you need to do to cope and get through it and then move forward. But do not deny yourself the, the opportunity to feel what is real for you. Mm -hmm. That's it. So what comments we got from the people? Yes, welcome Carolyn Jenkins, gifted, David, DC, that's my guy, Jordan Diaz, Bree, what up, Bree? What up, Bree? Mons. Don is joining us. What up, Steven? What up, Mo Poetry? And I don't, Hen this was quoted earlier. I guess somebody quoted her. Henrietta Lacks, someone said a Henry Henrietta Lacks quote earlier, was mentioned that. Don said it's about time that America re recognizes that racism is a trauma. There's so much power in community, Bree says. And Gita says, yes, realizing you're not on, you're not the only ones experiencing this situation helps. Sharing is healing. And that's what that's we it. That's it. And we have a question, and that's gonna lead into these, these next comments uh, as we was talking about the church. It's a very interesting perspective talking about the church. Is fanatical religion a lack of mental wholeness? What y'all think? Say say that question again. <laughs> is fanatical, is fanatical like religion a question to elaborate? <laughs> fanatical religion a lack of mental wholeness? Hmm, that's kind of good. I'll take I'll take the yeah. Stand. I know you. <laughs> yes. I know you're <laughs> <laughs> As I subtly mentioned earlier, uh -huh. take it to Jesus, pray about it. Well, that's, I've been praying. <laughs> I know now what, what? but- Well, um, you know, can, can I just say this one point and, and before I forget, cause my mind is older than you guys as you guys have that young, fresh mind. I got an old middle-aged mind, but anyway, um, we are so dependent on other things that we don't realize that everything that we need, the creator gifted, the creator, whomever that is for you spiritually, gifted that to us. Mm -hmm. Yes, everything mind, we need. A sound mind was purposed for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything that you need is already you already possess it's just based upon tapping into that source and knowing and you got to have a sense of belief if you're going to tap in you got to really not just say for instance if you think god is real you can't just say god is real because you go to church every sunday mm -hmm. you have to have had an experience or a spiritual encounter to know that this thing we can't see can't physically touch exists. So the same thing for your mental health. Yes, you can pray for whatever you need, understanding or whatever like that, but what you need, you already possess. You already have a sound mind. You have to believe you have a sound mind. It's that manifestation of your belief that is what's gonna project outwardly. And then sometimes you need to take that mustard seed of faith and plant it in different ground. Come on, somebody. You put yourself in different environments that encourages where you're trying to go. Someone had said something that was so dope to me is it said that. So now that I know who I want to be, who's gonna, who do I want around me to allow me to nurture the side of me that says I want to have son instead of wanting something not change me into what they think I should be but mm. encourage I need to be mm. that's what's up that 
it, go ahead. To, go ahead. To, to to add to that, that that lovely question that we received, um, just from my personal experience, like I've gone to a lot of churches and I got baptized a few times, trying to, you know, doing a lot of soul searching and trying to find that that savior, you know what I'm saying? And um it took a lot of moving around and a lot of work and running from myself and reaching out looking for God everywhere, everywhere. And then when I finally stopped and I got to know myself, who I really am behind all of the images that we've been given growing up, because I was raised in the church, Baptist church, you know what I'm saying? So it's religion is nothing new to me. I was raised in it. And so it's like, I went and searched outside for God. And then when I stopped, after all of the crying and running away from myself, I realized God had always been within me that whole time. So it's like to, to, to be taught to that God is in the sky, you know what I'm saying? Always looking down on us and judging us and all of these other things that also mess with the mind and emotions and all of this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like once you realize the God that we've been seeking has always been within us, it's a game changer. And that's just one level to that boost of mental health. Then there's yeah. the work. Yeah. Yes. God is everywhere. He got everything. He's got yeah. you. Everything is everything. The universe got you. Well, God is yeah. the universe. God yeah. is your breath. God is with you always. And that's not to say don't go to church. There are. I'm not saying that. I'm happy. <laughs> I am happy to say that I'm seeing people, uh, church members, are taking mental health seriously. And that's why I say, if you're in a church that you don't, they're not encouraging this new you, because if you're not growing, something is wrong. If you if if you, you need to go to another church that they take mental health seriously, that uh, encourages the belief system that you have, search, <laughs> go. The, the Lord is everywhere. The Lord will find you if you look. That's it. That, that's the key. Seeking you should find. Mm -hmm. That's the key. But as far as the question, um, First of all, fanatical religion has nothing to do with God. Uh, secondly, mm -hmm. secondly um, as far as does that mean that there's a, a issue with um, read it again because it was it was well put. Mm -hmm. uh, fan is fan is fanatical religion lacking wholeness? And I do want to answer that question different, differently now that I've meditated on it even more, but after you. Um, lacking wholeness. I think anything that you have to search for outwardly is a result of uh, a lack of wholeness in you. Because if you are whole, you don't need anything to <laughs> add to your wholeness. You're complete. So I think there's a lot of things not just religion, but I mean, like you said earlier, when you mentioned the whole thing of toxic relationships, if you're in a toxic relationship, it's not your fault, but there's a lack uh, of, um, there's a lack there, there's a void there. And although this situation is toxic, there is some trauma there. And although this, situation is toxic you believe that you're supposed to be here because you have trained your mind to believe if he beats me he loves me mm -hmm. you know if he cusses me he, if he ain't cussed me out what what's wrong with that he doesn't love me anymore like psychologically we it's like a mind over matter type of thing like it's funny in the lyric but R. Kelly said, my mind's telling me no, but my body is telling me yes. That's that DNA, that physiological <laughs> You know what I'm works. saying? Like, you may know, it may feel wrong, but if your mind, everything starts with here. So what, whatever you feel, even if it feels bad, if it doesn't align with what you think here, you're gonna stay here, you know what I mean? So. 
another <laughs> another thing about about the mind is just as much as it was it was created to solve problems it also creates problems and so like it it'll create problems just so it can fix those problems the yeah. mind is you know what i'm saying and it's it, yeah. it's all kinds of stuff and not just that a lot of those thoughts don't even belong to us because we're so connected and so like once we stop separating the mind body and spirit like it become it makes more sense it makes more sense because you know what i'm saying like where's this thought coming from well you know we're all spiritual too and so being that we're all connected we receive things from the cosmos from energy around us you know what i'm saying so bringing things like that into the combo into mental health conversations helps a lot too bringing energy the the you know the the uh the topic of energy into mental health conversations that that will help a lot honestly with with the mental so basically being a holistic being and the visual we see on a daily basis uh, for mass media, that is uh, another thing that we don't take into account. What are you listening to? What are you mm -hmm. watching that's influencing certain thoughts? Because um, like you said, we already sometimes get thoughts that's quote unquote out of character. It's like, where does that come from? Well, once again, being certain environments or feeding your body certain things, it's going to influence your mind's gonna play with it your mind has mm -hmm. never stopped working it's gonna play in the subconscious and the conscious so being aware of what you feed yourself has an impact on your mental health but to answer the question a lot more directly i think too much of too much of any too much of a good thing is a bad thing it's about balance if mm -hmm. you have a hand on something that you ingest on a regular basis that could be Bible, the religion, but you're so into it that you can can't distinct yourself from it and reality, then mm -hmm. there's a problem. Once again, spirituality, spirituality is important. God is important. Prayer is important. But God also came to, I believe it was um, Paul, if I'm not mistaken, it was one of the disciples. No, 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 it was Peter. In a dream, we uh, add a uh, gave him the fowl, the pig, and all the other stuff, because I don't, we ain't gonna get on the animal parts, <laughs> but just the idea that all this was created by God, why isn't this good enough to be enough for you to consume? I look at that when I hear people that are afraid to go to mental health clinicians and therapists. It's like, you would trust the person that created this building to lay the bricks right. You pray that God laid hands on the doctors when they went uh, with, with you in surgery. You pray that your car is gonna get you point A and point B. So why wouldn't you put that same faith in someone who is trained to help people with these types of situations? Don't allow yourself to be afraid to venture into something that you honestly don't know if, don't know much about. Trust that, learn to trust people, number one. That's a big thing in, in our community that is allowing all these secrets to kill us. We don't trust each other. Find the people to trust, build those relationships. And you might even find, you might not even, even have to go to the therapist. You just need someone to hear you, mm -hmm. true friends, true family. Well, ha true make sure family. it's a sound person and not a yes man, amen, or make sure you, you do distinguish who you can trust and who you can't trust with your interpersonal feelings and stuff. Because sometimes- and that, requires, that requires getting hurt and getting bumped so worse. You might lose somebody, you might start, oh, it sounds good, then all of a sudden they don't hit you back or you know whatever. But being less afraid to trust is part of the process of trusting yourself too, knowing, okay, I don't like this about this person, or this is what incites out of me, or do I need this kind of person in my life? Do I need to keep my arms length and still love them from afar? So. Yeah. And the, I think that's the benefit of, of having a, a therapist, you know what I'm saying? Somebody that don't know you, you know what I'm saying? So they, they, they can't really judge you. And if they do, they have to 
they have to keep, uh, you know, a flat face and you know what I'm saying, be professional about everything. Um, but uh, but also like with mental health and finding that that therapist that's going to work for you, like uh, even starting a mental health um, journey and going to a therapist and stuff like that, I think it's really important for us to talk about what you will run into when trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't have health insurance, you might get turned down and it pushes you away because, you know, I experienced that myself, like it led me into a deeper cycle of, you know, a bad mental state because when I tried to get help and I've heard this a lot, people will try to get help. And when they go get help, they get turned down because it costs too much or they don't have health insurance. But like, mm -hmm. if we had more resources, like, okay, so these places, take, you know what I'm saying, they go by your income or these places, you know what I'm saying, you don't, they're for free. Different things like that will help to avoid that, you know, people feeling like they're getting set up to fail. You know, like, you know, like I tried to reach out and you know what I'm saying, like they turned me away because I didn't have this and that. It's a, uh, it can be tough, but if we, awesome. if we talked about the, the possibilities of what could happen and let people know like people will try to force medication on you so be true to yourself you got to analyze yourself like for real like do you really need this medication because some will try to force medication on you and some people don't really need it some do but, so basically do your research yes um, be your own advocate of wellness and health doctors and practitioners are put in position to help guide and lead you to a state of wellness, but you are a part of that. Mm -hmm. I always encourage my patients, understand your diagnoses. So do research on what those things are. Um, do research even when it comes to the medication, because I agree 100%. It, in this day and age, because uh, pharmaceuticals is a multi-trillion dollar business and it um, generates a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Um, you will, you will hear foreign practitioners say about our, the way that we practice medicine is that we do not practice to heal disease. We practice to sustain it because yeah. sustaining it equals profit. Uh, so like T said, do your research, know the side, side effects of medications and understand when it's appropriate to take these meds, meaning the time of day um, and know the uh, appropriate dosages, especially with our young people that might have um, a behavioral um, issues and stuff, they're quick to put them on medication and not do non-medicinal treatment, you know? And then mm -hmm. that affects their, sometimes their learning ability because if they're putting on too much medication, they can't focus, they can't, focus. they can't function, you know? That happened to my little sister. She was put on too much medication and she couldn't even focus. So T is absolutely right. You have to be an active participant in your wellness, in your plan of care. Ask questions. And if the, the practitioners can't give you a satisfactory um, answer, then you like so has said, you seek for yourself and seek and make sure it's sound. Don't believe everything that you hear. That's right. Believe everything that you hear. <laughs> Seek sound information and make a sound judgment for your wellness. That was very elegant right there. See, this is why you all here, because you just have a way with words. <laughs> we, you all have, a, this is great. Yeah, we all do. I just wanted to highlight it, but I, I, I didn't know. Anyways, <laughs> we're going to move on. We're going to move on to all. Uh, uh, what's going on, Highlighter Community Organization, which leads into our commercial of uh, a business in Cincinnati. So give me a moment. I'm going to screen, share my screen with y'all. All right, 
Can y'all see me all right? Y'all see this picture? Yes. Yep. All right. So who are highlighting, the, what, what, well, let me just start back. What's going on highlights a community organization in the Cincinnati area. It could be in Kentucky, Indiana, but we focused on Cincinnati, Ohio. If you have anyone that uh, has a business that you want to highlight that's doing work in the community, please send us information and we'll be sure to highlight them on our next episode. But what we have today is Blooming You. Blooming You is an empowerment life coaching program founded by mental health clinician, youth mentor, Daniel Hutchinson. It is a refreshing environment where one can completely be yourself and let go of all of what the world has placed upon you to carry. Welcoming, welcoming to all persons from any background or walk of life, including children, they offer Reiki, guided meditation, pour out sessions, and empowerment life coaching services for healing, self-care, and personal growth. Services are done via telephone, video chat, and in person for local clients. Blooming U also offers therapeutic coaching groups to group homes, schools, clubs, etc. Their mission is to empower souls to not only believe in themselves, but to also heal holistically, to encourage, teach, and walk with their clients, clients along with their journey as they recreate, nurture, and rebuild. They are located in the Evendale area at 10746 Reading Road, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45241. Open Monday through Thursday, 4 p.m. through 10 p.m., Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can also contact them by phone at 513-304-8155 or by email at bloomingyoulifecoaching at gmail.com. To learn more and or schedule an appointment, visit their website at blooming, www.bloomingyoulifecoaching.com. All right. Great. Yeah, that was. That was um yeah, a commercial commercial break. And one of the reasons I also wanted to highlight um leading into our next section where we talk about our sto our stories with mental health and or mental illness. That was my life coach, Daniel Hutchinson's uh, organization. It's a life coaching program, but she's also, as I mentioned, a mental health clinician. And one of the good, the main good thing takeaway I took from um, taking her sessions is that she showed me that there was a lot more going on that I did not realize. Mm -hmm. And I was able to talk through, not along with the life coaching sessions that was included, was able to find out that there was a lot more going on in my head that I just accepted as being normal because I wasn't normal. And I mean that when I was growing up, I always knew that I had a little bit of a difference from the other kids and my experiences with um, my own community really made me look at myself from a fearful state. And when you have, when you start to ask certain questions about why is this, why is that, I experience that with that experience church hurt, and it made me uh, very rejectful of how 
my family and peers looked at anything that was outside of what you was told was supposed to be. You couldn't question. You couldn't dig any deeper than the surface. And this is what I told you so. So to get a little bit more in depth, just to be honest, I, the main thing that is caused distress for me is racing thoughts. I will have thoughts that will speed past in my mind at a very high rate and it'll make me lose track of reality, time, and what I'm doing. So to explain how that is, if I were to think I'm going to go start my car, I'll have a series of seven thoughts on, th on seven different topics, whether they're connected or not, and I'll forget in less than a minute or two what I was about to do. I have studied and it, it can range from ADHD, OCD, and I have found that other members of my family struggle with bipolar, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and onward. And the people that I mentioned, at least a majority of them, not all of them, majority of them that I see, they were not treated as, they were not looked at as to under, be understood, they're just there. And so that made me retract from uh, just, I'm not gonna let anybody know that I'm maybe this, that, and the third. I'm just gonna keep it all to myself. And when I talk about these things, nobody's really listening anyway. So I internalize a lot of hurt feelings, a lot of fear, a lot of anger, and it molded into a state of depression where my only coping mechanism was writing. And that's partly why I'm a writer, poet, hip hop artist, because it, it does something for my brain that I don't get on the outside. So it went ahead for me when this pandemic hit, when I would use my coping mechanism was the stage. I would perform my heart out and that was my tension release. But because shows were canceled and then other financial things happened would put my plans under again, all I had was myself and that made me very uncomfortable. And it put me in a dark spiral where if it wasn't for someone giving me call my phone uh, service go off, I don't know where I would have been at that point. So part of the reason why I agreed to do the mental health section of this one, because I do feel that is important that we need to talk about these things, whether that is in the spectrum of getting your health, mental health into a more proper state, or if you have mental illnesses, let's figure that what that is out and do something about it. Let's not sit in the dark anymore with our feelings and silently, quietly die while everyone thinks we're the happiest go lucky people in the womb and it's a mask that we put on. And that was me. So uh, going to life coaching has helped me understand uh, mental health a whole lot more, different mental illnesses. And I will be uh, seeking uh, a therapist or a psychiatrist. I'm still not sure. I'm still doing research. Again, I say I'm still ignorant of this. I know a lot, but I still can learn more. And that's part, part of the reason why I'm here is to encourage others that you don't have to die every day in silence. Mm. That's, the That's, That's good. Fair. Just to re repeat that you don't have to die every day in silence. Mm, mm, mm. That's good. No, oh, you want so, us to go? Yeah, oh, go off of that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll be feeling that. I'll, I'll feel, I resonate. No, but um. So I guess so. Now we're talking about our personal experience. Yes. Okay. Um. So uh, I am clinically diagnosed with a uh, bipolar disorder, um, borderline personality disorder and PTSD. Um, I feel like I've been, it's a, it's been a real battle, like going back and forth with that. But anyway, like I've been, I had been running for a very long time and hiding behind drinking, you know, and partying and stuff like that. And um, um, 
let's see, when was that? 2015. I admitted myself to the to the to the mental hospital because you know I feared my own life. Like I felt like I was really gonna do something to myself, and I went to like this. It's a, it's it's like a clubhouse for people who deal with mental health or people who have mental health issues. Um, I went there and somebody had made me follow them to the hospital to get myself taken care of. Um, uh, shortly after that, um, I attempted suicide in 2016 um, and ended up in the hospital again. And um, during that time, like in between that time, I was I was making like this uh, mental health documentary and. I had finished it in 2016 and, and that's literally what saved my life because I was like, who am I to, you know what I'm saying, off myself. And then like in my in the documentary, tell people like if you ever feel like this or that, you call suicide hotline, you do this, you reach out, and I not do that same same thing. It's like, no. So I literally like hey, that is literally what saved my life um then and um, you know since then it's it's been a ride it's been a ride and yeah um so that's so much stories to, to that which which can wait but that's the basic story and that's what made me want to become a mental health um advocate to advocate for silent voices to advocate for people who are afraid and you know the more I came out and the more I come out even still with you know the different experiences that I have, the more people who do come out like, yo, I experienced the same thing too. And like, it's okay. It's okay because this is not the end. So yeah, that's, that's everything. That's a general experience. That's great. I'm glad that you, just like me, I'm glad that you're here to speak that. And it was making me think um, real quick, I think a lot, we have this idea that leaders that are just supposed to lead, they're supposed to be just um, super strong and not show emotions and stuff to, an, to a degree. But I mm -hmm. think people forget that they're human just like us. Dr. Martin Luther King, as great as a leader that he was, he never sought professional help, even though he had such dark depression. He would mm. just always give that smile, that strength, that sternness, but you never saw where his demons manifested. And I think if leaders showed that uh, sense of vulnerability, that will be a little bit more encouraging. I'm not completely sure how that can work. We can, maybe we can find out the answer, but it's just something to think about showing that vulnerability. It actually makes you more powerful because, oh, if they can be that vulnerable, I know I can be that this vulnerable and still overcome like they have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank God for the arts, you know what I'm saying? How the yes. arts save, you know? Um, and again, I, I second that and thank God for all of our lives. It's interesting um, how suicidal ideation plays a part in mental illness. And I don't think it's necessarily uh, a lack of will to live it's a lack of will to live this way mm -hmm. and not understand and not knowing how to get out of this this um thing we have no control over right um so yeah as i mentioned earlier depression is um uh, my mental illness um it was, I think it was, uh, and it's uh, a combination of things uh, due to uh, childhood trauma, um, situational things in adulthood, um, external stressors, um, and just like um, Soul just pointed out, we are conditioned to behave a certain way. We're conditioned to it's just us as a people. We have we we have this S on our chest and this cape on our back, and we're supposed to be strong. And weakness is not an issue. And mental health isn't a weakness. It's just a part of who we are. Um, but it, it it doesn't win. We can overcome. And um, so yeah, I first uh, realized. 
um, my disorder, I think when I was a freshman in college, um, after a while, that's, I think that's the reason why, um, what I think that's what happens when you suppress a lot of things, eventually it comes to a head and then you feel like you're crazy, you know, and you can't function, you don't know what's going on, you're an emotional wreck. And my financial advisor actually uh, referred me to a clinical psychologist on campus who happened to be an African woman, um, African American woman. And I was so thankful because they had plenty of psychologists on campus, but he specifically directed me to the African-American um, counselor. And I was so thankful that he did that. And he was sensitive enough to understand what that meant for me as a young black woman, because the way she treated me was relative to my situation, to me as a black woman. I felt comfortable with her. It was almost maternal, you know, and so, and again, it was when I realized therapy isn't, like I said, the therapist got this magic wand and they're just gonna cure you. They lead you to the answers you already possess. Mm -hmm. And I am a strong advocate for therapy there. I've been in therapy consistently since then over time. There will come events, things that I happen, and I will voluntarily check myself into a therapeutic program. Um, I too have uh, struggled with uh, suicidal ideation. I too have um, been on a 72 hour hold in the hospital uh, due to suicidal attempt. A lot of people don't know that you know, but that, that has happened. And um, the ironic part about it, and T, I don't know if you felt the same way, when you're institutionalized uh, for that, it is in that moment you realize you want to live. Prior to that, I thought, yeah, I'm cool on this. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, I, I just think I'll be better off not here. But being uh, in that environment kind of woke me up and re helped me realize, yeah, I want to live. You know what I'm saying? So I got to figure this thing out. I got to figure out how to cope and how to navigate and how to find um, who I am within this um, journey and overcome these thoughts that plagued me, this uh, condition that has uh, held me captive. And a lot of people wouldn't think that I suffer from depression um, because a lot of people just take me as a, a happy-go-lucky type of person, but it's a part of my experience, you know, and it's the part that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a lot of times with our mental illness, we have to be careful with triggers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those come from relationships, not just like intimate relationship as far as like a partner, but it could be from your family, you know, work related. So we have to um, be mindful of our triggers that, you know, um, kind of help that kind of cause us to spiral out of control. Um, but it's a, it's a daily it's a daily thing. You know, I have to daily check my mind. I do pray. I'm, into, I'm implementing exercise for that huge stress, I'm, um, which is the good stress on the body. I am um, implementing meditation, like whatever it takes, you know, to get out of the hole I'm willing to do so. That's my experience. That's good. So I think it's a perfect um, time to bring up what are we each individual individually doing to help our mental health? 
like I said, I, I'm doing a lot of a lot more exercise. I feel like that kind of helps me. Uh, what I eat um, is imperative as well because it affects how I feel. Um, my environment, um, establishing boundaries um, more so than I have in the past, um, being more mindful of my relationships. Like I said, identifying my triggers and um, making sure that I don't put myself in those positions to be triggered. Um, like I said, meditation, reading, you know, um, sometimes fasting. I do fast, um, things of that nature. All right, Tierra. Um, me, uh, I have, <laughs> I have quite a few, uh, coping skills. So having coping skills set up, practicing like everyday living as far as stretching, I have to stretch every day and it's, it's deep stretching it's mixed with yoga basically, but deep stretching, conscious breathing, always checking my thoughts and my energy, energy checking all day, every day, checking my breathing, because breathing tells me a lot about if my body is stressed or not, um, checking my energy because, I, you know, checking whether, uh, it, you know, I'm heavy or light, anxiety or depression, um, moods, like with BPD, it's always crazy moods. So learning how to stabilize and going to therapy, obviously, learning how to, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know how, how you were saying, um, Natasha, like uh, dealing with uh, uh, having other relationships, out, even outside of the intimate relationship, relationship with other human beings, drawing boundaries. One of my most important um, things that I'm working on right now is self-love, self-acceptance, um, and knowing my worth, accepting my worth and realizing my worth and you know what I'm saying? And and just healing from, you know, those childhood traumas that taught me, you know, or made me feel like I wasn't enough. And finding that worth within myself and bringing that into the light. So, yes, a lot of self-work all the way. Well, sis, you are more than enough, just a FYI. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much a lot of what y'all said is what I do as well. Um, so I'll just add something that wasn't spoken on. Um, being uh, treating myself how I would treat other people. Mm -hmm. I'm very uh, loving and compassionate to other people. Translating that to someone that honestly you were trained to hate. Mm is after 30 years it's work it's a lot of work um meditating you said uh breathing and then also conversing with myself either inside my head or with my voice my physical voice to counteract the thoughts um that come and keep me focused and balanced and then acceptance of things that have happened as just as they are objectively and then addressing where it hurts how it hurts why it hurts and making peace with that mm -hmm. and accepting that the people that were involved they're going to be them and it's not my responsibility to change their mind otherwise what's important is that I change how I feel towards that situation because if I don't, I won't move on. And then lastly, I would say is learning how to um, be uh, what well, goes into self-love like our last episode, but being okay, being compassionate with myself. Um, that goes into uh, saying learn how to love yourself, but showing compassion on where you fail at. 
if you if if you have if I have days where I know I've screwed up, I'll say I'll get it next I'll get it tomorrow. And slowly changing the thought patterns of how I comp communicate with myself on a daily basis. And it's slow, but it's effective because just even recently, yesterday, I was in a situation where I conceded to an old habit and I said, you know, I'm not going to be able to fix this, but I can save something. So I took uh, the long road and they, whether they appreciate it or not, um, they were definitely frustrated. But I know in my heart and my energy is that I made up for what I did instead of just letting it be and making it worse. I at least cushioned the blow and explained where I'm at right now. And that I don't have it all together all the time. Sometimes I'm, I have off days and I'm just sitting in the car with a bunch of McDonald's and knowing that I'm supposed to be eating my mental salads. So <laughs> being compassionate with myself and accepting and doing the inner work. It's like Natasha says, we all have it. We just have to be around people uh, feeding on our spirits, our daily lives with something opposite than what we see right now. And in the day that's dreaming, everybody needs to dream again. Yes. All right. So in closing, I think this was pretty good. Uh, we had some, I think it was just the fact that this was so important. We had so many dang issues coming up. And uh, even in between, we had a little bit of a technical glitchy thing happening here, but we made it this far. This was a, yes. a podcast that was definitely delayed, but it was meant to happen. And I'm glad of how it has come about. I think a lot of people need to hear this. Need, people need to see this. Um, being this honest, especially uh, us being artists at heart in the community, for them to see somebody who's actually they can physically see that they know on a regular basis to be this vulnerable, we don't know how deep the puddles are going to go with this walk to throwing. So, my esteemed yes. colleagues, Natasha Miller, Tierra Porterhouse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he gave my whole government. Okay. <laughs> I did not. Do you have a middle name? I do. And I, if I'm not telling you. I didn't say it. I'm just saying with some the that's why mine's is composed of soul. You know what I'm saying? You should take it. Yeah. <laughs> but now nah. change your name. <laughs> right. I'm like, dang, I, you know. No, but I am I am Stephen Lynn because I'm good enough. Also known as Soul proposed and so and this was introducing the me mental health to the black community it's a pretty much a preview into the meaty podcast that we were doing called erasing the shame where we specifically talk about key things that people say like take it to god or i ain't going to no doctor or i ain't uh the things people say i'm not crazy we go in detail of why we say that Again, as we mentioned earlier, if we know what something is, if we understand it, we have better options how we can tackle it. So until then, you guys be safe. Appreciate everyone for being here. And we hope that what we, uh, the words we share today helps you in some way, shape, or form. Appreciate y'all. One love. Much love. Peace. Okay, give it a moment. I think I stopped it. <laughs>